war is hell. It could almost be said that it is one of humanity's defining traits. No other creature on this planet invests so much time, energy and resources into perfecting the art of death. Over the centuries we have developed a plethora of tools to assist us in spreading our influence across this planet through force. Often at the expense of others who do not share our ideologies or approved notions of what's right and wrong. Despite the incredible evolution in killing power of weaponry used to wage these wars, the reasons and justifications to initiate these conflicts are still as antiquated as the earliest of man's achievements. If we can learn what triggers this desire for aggression and bloodshed, then perhaps we can move forward into an era of peace and harmony. This is the story of one such war, often overshadowed by the events of World War II. The Winter War, also known as the First soviet finnish War, was a war between the Soviet Union and Finland beginning with a Soviet invasion of Finland on the 30th of November 1939, three months after the outbreak of World War II, and ended three and a half months later with the Moscow Peace Treaty on the 13th of March 1940. Despite superior military strength, especially in tanks and aircraft, the Soviet Union suffered severe losses and initially made little headway. The League of Nations deemed the attack illegal and expelled the Soviet Union from the organization. World War I led to the collapse of the Russian Empire during the Russian Revolution of 1917. On November 15, 1917, the, the Bolshevik there. Russian government declared that national minorities possessed the right to self-determination, including the right to secede and form a separate state, which gave Finland a small window of opportunity. On the 6th of December 1917, the Senate of Finland declared the nation's independence. Soviet Russia, later the Soviet Union, recognized the new Finnish government just three weeks after this declaration, with Finland achieving full sovereignty in May of 1918. Finland joined the League of Nations in 1920 and sought security guarantees, but Finland's primary goal was cooperation with Scandinavian countries. The period after the Finnish Civil War until the early 1930s was politically unstable time in Finland because of the continued rivalry between the Conservatives and the Socialists, culminating in a failed coup and the resulting civil war. After Soviet involvement in the Finnish Civil War, no formal peace treaty was signed, and in 1932 the Soviet-Finnish Non-Aggression Pact was signed between both countries, and it was reaffirmed for 10 years in 1934. Foreign trade in Finland was booming, but less than 1% of it was with the Soviet Union. Soviet General Secretary Joseph Stalin lamented that the Soviet Union could not halt the Finnish Revolution. He thought that Finland posed a direct threat to Leningrad and that the area and defences of Finland could be used to invade the Soviet Union or restrict their fleet movements. Soviet propaganda began to paint Finland's leadership as a vicious fascist clique. When Stalin gained absolute power through the Great Purge of 1938, the Soviets changed their foreign policy towards Finland and began to pursue the reconquest of provinces of Tsarist Russia. In April of 1938, the NKVD agent, Boron Yatsev, contacted the Finnish Foreign Ministry and the Finnish Prime Minister, stating that the Soviets did not trust Germany and that war was considered possible between the two countries. Yatsev suggested that Finland cede at least some of the islands in the Gulf of Finland, but Finland refused. Negotiations continued throughout 1938 without results, with the Finnish reception of Soviet entries decidedly cool. As the violent purges in Russia's Soviet Union resulted in a poor opinion of the country, Finland attempted to negotiate a military cooperation plan with Sweden, but they denied it. The Soviet Union and Nazi Germany signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August of 1939. While publicly it was a non-aggression treaty, it secretly included a protocol in which Eastern European countries were divided into spheres of interest, with Finland falling into the Soviet sphere. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany began its invasion of Poland. On the 17th of September, the Soviets invaded Eastern Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, soon forced to accept treaties that allowed the Soviets to establish military bases on their soil. Unlike these other countries, Finland started a gradual mobilization under the guise of additional refresher training. The Soviets had already started intensive mobilization near the Finnish border in 1938, 
and they demanded that the border between the USSR and Finland on the Karelian Isthmus be moved, and all fortifications removed. The Soviet offer divided the Finnish government, but was eventually rejected with respect to the opinion of the public and the parliament. The Finns made two counter-offers to cede areas that would double the distance between Leningrad and the Finnish border, but were far less than what the Soviets had demanded. The Finnish delegation returned home on the 13th of November and took for granted that their negotiations would continue. On the 26th of November 1939, an incident was reported near the border with Finland, with a Soviet border guard post being shelled by an unknown party, resulting in, according to Soviet reports, four deaths and nine injuries. Research conducted by several Finnish and Russian historians later concluded that the shelling was a false flag operation since there were no artillery units stationed nearby and that it was carried out from the Soviet side of the border by the, an NKVD unit. Soviet leadership had expected total victory within a few weeks, with the Red Army just completed the invasion of Eastern Poland at a cost of less than 4,000 casualties. Commander Kirill Metzgerov reported the terrain of coming operations is split by lakes, rivers, swamps and ent almost entirely covered by forests. The proper use of our forces will be difficult. These doubts though were not reflected in his troops deployments. It was announced publicly that the Finnish campaign would take two weeks at most and Soviet soldiers had even been warned not to cross the border mistakenly into Sweden. Stalin's purges in 1930s had devastated the officer corps of the Red Army. Those purged include three of its five marshals, 80% of a division or higher level commanders, and 36,000 officers of all ranks. Fewer than half of all the officers remained, and they were commonly replaced by soldiers who were less competent, but more loyal to their superiors. Unit commanders were overseen by political commissars, whose approval was needed to approve and ratify military decisions. Soviet generals were impressed by the success of German blitzkrieg tactics but they had been tailored to conditions in Eastern Europe with its dense, well-mapped network of paved roads. Armies fighting there had recognized supply and communication centers, which could easily be targeted by armored vehicle regiments. Finnish army centers, in contrast, were deep inside the country. There were no paved roads, and even gravel or dirt roads were scarce. Most of the terrain consisted of trackless forests and swamps. Once observed, the landscape was described as every acre of its surface being created to be the despair of an attacking military force. The Finnish Defence Command had estimated that no more than 12 divisions would attack along the whole of the border. This manpower estimate would have favoured the attacker 3 to 1. The true ratio was much higher, with 12 divisions attacking just at north of Lake Lagoda alone. Finland had a large force of reservists, which were trained in regular manoeuvres, some of which had experience in the recent Finnish Civil War. The soldiers were almost universally trained in basic survival techniques such as skiing. The Finnish army was not able to equip all its soldiers with proper uniforms at the outbreak of the war, but its reservists were equipped with warm civilian clothing. Finnish tank forces were operationally non-existent. The situation was so severe that Finnish soldiers sometimes had to maintain their ammunition supply by looting the bodies of dead Soviet soldiers. The favoured Soviet armoured tactic was a simple frontal charge, the weakness of which could be exploited. The Finns learned that close range tanks could be dealt with in many ways. For example, logs and crowbars jammed into the bogey wheels would often immobilise tanks. Soon, Finns fielded better ad hoc weaponry such as the Molotov cocktail, a glass bottle filled with flammable liquids and with a simple hand-lit fuse. Molotov cocktails were eventually mass-produced by the Finnish Alco Betvich company and were bundled with matches with which to light them. The winter of 1939 to 1940 was exceptionally cold, with the Karelian Isthmus experiencing a record low temperature of minus 43 degrees centigrade. The cold and snow, forest and long hours of darkness were factors that the Finns could use to their advantage. The Finns dressed in layers and the ski troopers wore a lightweight white snow cape. This snow camouflage made the ski troopers almost invisible so that they could move more easily and execute guerrilla tactics against Soviet columns. At the beginning of the war, Soviet tanks were painted in standard olive drab and men dressed in regular khaki uniforms. Most Soviet soldiers had proper winter clothes but this was not the case for every unit. 
Thousands of Soviet soldiers died of frostbite. With the Soviets also lacking skills in skiing, soldiers were restricted to movement by road and were forced to move in long columns. The Red Army lacked proper winter tents and troops had to sleep in improvised yeah, shelters. Attacking, uh, uh, Some Soviets incurred frostbite casualties as high as 10% before even crossing the Finnish border. At least 61,000 Soviet troops were sick or frostbitten during the war. In the battles of Lagoda Karelia in the Arctic port of Petsomo, the Finns used guerrilla tactics. The Red Army was superior in numbers and material, but Finns used the advantages of speed, manoeuvre warfare and economy of force. The Finns isolated smaller portions of numerically superior Soviet forces, dividing them into smaller groups and dealing with them individually attacking from all sides. For many of the encircled Soviet troops in a pocket, staying alive was an ordeal comparable to combat. The men were freezing and starving and endured poor sanitary conditions. The problem, however, was that the Finns were mainly too weak to fully exploit their success. Some of the pockets encircled soldiers were held out for weeks or even hey, months, let's go. binding up a huge number of Finnish forces. The worst of these ambushes occurred when the Soviets lost the 44th and parts of the 163rd Rifle Division, comprising of about 14,000 troops. They were completely destroyed by a Finnish ambush as they marched along a forest road. A small unit blocked the Soviet advance while the 9th Division cut off the retreat route. They split the enemy force into smaller groups and then proceeded to destroy the remnants in detail as they retreated. The Soviets estimated to lose 7 to 9,000 casualties alone. The Finnish units only 400. After this battle, the Finnish troops captured dozens of tanks, artillery, anti-tank guns, hundreds of trucks and almost 2,000 horses and much needed ammunition and medical supplies. Stalin was not pleased with the results of December in the Finnish campaign. The Red Army had been humiliated and by the third week of the war, Soviet propaganda was already working to explain the failures of the Soviet military to the populace, blaming bad terrain and harsh climate and falsely claiming that the Mannerheim line was just as strong if not stronger than the Maginot line. They also claimed that the Americans had sent a thousand of their best pilots to Finland. After changing tactical doctrines to meet the realities of the situation, the Soviets shipped large numbers of new tanks and artillery pieces to the theatre. Troops were increased from 10 divisions to 26, with 7 tank brigades at a total of 600,000 soldiers. On the 1st of February, the Red Army began in a large offensive firing over 300,000 artillery shells into the Finnish line in the first day. The Finns took shelter inside their fortifications from the bombardments and repaired damage as they could at night. The situation led quickly to war exhaustion amongst the Finns, who lost over 3,000 soldiers. The Soviets also made occasional small infantry assaults with one or two companies. After 10 days of constant artillery barrage, the Soviets achieved a breakthrough on the Western Karelian Isthmus. The Finns attempted desperately to reopen negotiations with Moscow, but the Soviets did not respond. By mid-February, it became clear that the Finnish forces were rapidly approaching full exhaustion. For the Soviets, casualties were extremely high and the situation was a source of political embarrassment to the Soviet regime. With the spring thaw approaching, the Soviet forces risked becoming bogged down in the forests. Look at the Finnish the Foreign Minister Valno Tana arrived in Stockholm on the 12th of February and negotiated in peace terms with the Soviets through the Swedes. German representatives, not aware of the negotiations, suggested on the 17th of February that Finland negotiate an end to the war. The Finns proposed an armistice on the 6th of March, but the Soviets, wanting to keep the pressure on the Finnish government, declined the offer. On the 9th of March, the Finnish military situation on the Karelian Isthmus was dire. As troops were experiencing heavy casualties, artillery ammunition was exhausted and weapons were wearing out. The Finnish government, realising that the hoped for Franco-British military expedition would not arrive in time, had little choice but to accept the Soviet terms. The Finnish president resisted the idea of giving up any territory to the Soviet Union but was forced to agree to sign the Moscow Peace Treaty. When he signed the document, the tormented president uttered the well-known words, let the hand wither that signs this monstrous treaty. Until the next transmission, Commander Tyrell, out.